So each one of us has had the experience where you go through something and there's a lot involved and it's a tough battle, but you get to the end of the, the battle only to realize that there's another battle that's right on the heels of it. You could see it really clearly in, um, in the playoffs in sports for those of you who like it. So um, I've been watching a bunch of hockey recently. And so uh, two teams just made it to the Stanley Cup finals. But both series went to game seven. Now, in one of those, the New York Rangers uh, lost to the, uh, I don't even remember what, oh, the Tampa Bay Lightning, right? And it's like you go through this whole series, and it's, and it's back and forth, and the drama is building, and then you either win or lose, and the person who wins, now they go on, and now they have another challenge. And life can be that way, right? Like where you have this one challenge, and you go through all this stuff, and you're like, okay, I'm there. And then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, now that this one is over, now I have another even greater challenge. And I bring this up because in the story that we're looking at in the book of Esther, that Esther is having that same experience where we hit a point where we're like, okay, now one thing is fixed, but now there's an even greater challenge ahead. So I want you to open up in your Bibles to Esther chapter 8. Esther, and I'm going to get us caught up to speed on where we are in Esther, but Esther chapter 8. Now, if you didn't bring a Bible with you, there's Bibles on the pews in front of you, so I want you to pull it on out. Or if you have a smartphone or a tablet or whatever, you can just open that thing up and just type in Esther chapter 8. For those of you who are part of our online community, we love you guys. We welcome you. Don't forget, open up another browser window. Put in Esther chapter 8. If you're flipping through the Bible, the book of Esther is pretty easy to find. The book of Psalms is really large. So you find Psalms, if you go to your left, then there's the book of Job. That's also a large book. And you go right next to Job is the book of Esther. So Esther chapter 8. Now, where are we in the, in the story of Esther? Remember, Esther became the queen of the Medo-Persian Empire, right? And she was a Jewish woman. Now, there was a man named Haman who was one of the, the, the king's top advisors. And Haman was very well respected. He was very wealthy. But Haman had an insecurity. He wanted the honor, and when he didn't get it, it ate his lunch. And there was a man named Mordecai who would not bow down to Haman, right? And, and Haman was so angry about it that not only did Haman want to destroy Mordecai, he decided he wanted to destroy all of Mordecai's people as well, the Jewish people. But what Haman doesn't know is that Esther is Jewish, and Mordecai raised Esther as his own daughter. And so the king, not knowing that his queen was Jewish, agreed with Haman because Haman said, hey, this is what's going on, and and they made a decree that on a specific day about a year later, all the Jewish people were allowed to be killed and all of their goods were allowed to be plundered. And Remember, Mordecai starts fasting and he's seeking the Lord and he summons Esther and says to her, in effect, listen, you have to do something. And she said, look, I don't know that I can do anything. And he said, but don't you realize that you're there for such a time as this? And I've been making the point all the way through this series that I want all of us to feel like that because we are all like that. That God has us in situations and circumstances for such a time. And I think what happens when we think about people who step into something, realizing that they are God's man or God's woman in a situation, we always think that they, everybody just feels like, oh, yes, I'm God's person. But really we're all like Esther most of the time where we take a step of faith, but we're not really sure that we're the right person for the job. And if that's you, if you're like, man, I don't feel like the right person for that, or I don't, you know, man, maybe God could have chosen someone more gifted. Esther felt that way, but she was spiritually prepared. She was fasting, and she's like, okay, I'm going to do it. And she went before the king, and, and more recently in the study, she went before the king, and she decided she wanted to have a banquet for the king and Haman. And then the next day, she's like, can you guys come back? We'll have another one. And sure enough, while this was happening, Haman erected a gallows. Because he wanted Mordecai dead so bad. He didn't even want to wait the month anymore. He's just like, we're going to kill him. And sure enough, at the second banquet, 
or gala that Esther had, it came on out. Esther told her husband that there was a man who wants to kill her and all of her people. And the king was like, what? Who would dare do such a thing? He's like, well, it's Haman. And sure enough, the king left the banquet. He was totally mad, right? And then when he came on back, Haman was so overcome with trying to save his own life that right as the king walked back in, he was reaching over to Esther on her couch. And the king totally thought Haman was making the moves on his bride. God's irony is an amazing thing sometimes. And sure enough, the king had Haman hung on the gallows that he had erected for Mordecai. That's where we left off two weeks ago. That literally Haman fell into the pit that he had prepared for Mordecai. And you would think, okay, great. So this, this man, this evil man now is gone. Everything's better. But that's actually not the case. There's another battle that needs to be fought. So look at what it says in chapter 8, Esther chapter 8, verse 1. It says this. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, and Mordecai came before the king. For Esther had told how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman the Agagite and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. Verse 4, And the king held out the golden scepter towards Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king. And the king said, If it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in the sight... In his sight, and the thing seems right to the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes. Let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamathia, the Agagite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's province. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hand on the Jews. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. So you see what's going on. Although Haman is gone... The decree to annihilate the Jews that was still 10 months away was still in place. And so what's fascinating here is that although a major enemy has been disposed of, there's an even greater enemy at work. And I'm going to take some time to apply that, but I wanted to make a point about this because I think... If I don't make the point, we're going to forget. And it kind of drives everything we've been talking about. That It's this, that God uses people to bring deliverance. God uses people to bring deliverance. It's so often that you know this, that as you're going through these things, you can miss what is the most essential point. This is the for such a time statement. That God uses people. See, God used Esther and Mordecai. Right? And now we have them step, stepping into the situation and saying, okay, listen, we need a new decree that's going to counteract the last decree or else all of the Jewish people are still going to die. God uses people. And I think what happens sometimes for us in church is we forget that God uses people. How many of you have heard the joke, and there's many variations of this, that there's a, a flood going on. And and there's a person, he's a Christian, and and, and he says, Lord, will you save me? And the Lord says, I will save you. And so he's up on his roof above all the the, the flood waters, and a guy comes with a helicopter and says, come on down, I got a ladder for you. We're going to get you out of here. And he says, no, 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 God's going to save me. And the guy with the helicopter goes to save somebody else because he doesn't want to go. And then sure enough, someone comes up in a little rowboat. Hey, man, jump on in. We got this boat here. It's good to go. Come on. He said, no, 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 God's going to save me. 
And then sure enough, the waters go high and the guy drowns. And he gets to heaven. He says, Lord, I thought you were going to save me. And the Lord's like, I sent a helicopter and a rowboat, bro. <laughs> God uses people as his instruments to bring deliverance. And just like this project we're going to do to help people who are in the war zone in the Ukraine, just like the shoe project that we did to help people who don't have access to shoes and they can't go to school, just like the Jesus at street level box drop we do for Christmas, all these different things that we do, we realize that God will use people to bring deliverance. Do you believe that God has raised you up for such a time to be somebody who can bring deliverance for other people, that God has you in a situation to, to be there and to be involved to help change the world. See, that's why as a church, we like to say we're simply responding to Jesus because Jesus doesn't want us just to receive God's word and be like, okay, good, I understand God's word. But God's like, look, I want to change you so that I can use you to be a change agent in the world. And everything about our culture says it's all about you. Keep it internal. It's yours. It's your life. But our Bible says, no, your life is not your own. You were bought at a price. And Jesus wants to invite us into recreating the world in Jesus' name. Now, remember I made the point that sometimes one battle gives way to another battle? The elimination of Haman. Haman was the driver of the destruction. And we always have to remember that when God uses us as deliverers, it's the deliverer with a small d. That God can use you and I to alleviate suffering and do things. But there's an even greater deliverance that God wants to do. And that deliverance is done by one man, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. See, Haman, Haman is the immediate issue. But Jesus wants to heal us from a greater issue. It's like this, and a lot of us have experienced this. Maybe you struggle with anger or drinking or you have a history or whatever, right? And you're like, I need deliverance from this thing because this thing is destroying my life, right? And a lot of times in that situation, someone comes and gives their life to Jesus, right? They're in a crisis. They give their life to Jesus, and Jesus fixes the crisis point, the Haman. But then once that thing is fixed, people stop following Jesus. They got through the crisis moment. But really, Christianity is not just about fixing our crisis moments. It's about the fact that we have crisis moments because we have an, an overarching nature, a sin nature. See, a lot of us come to Jesus because we struggle with sin, something that we do. Jesus came to deliver us from our sin nature. Not what we do, it's who we are. Right? So we can be deliverers with a small D. We can give a cup of cold water. But only Jesus is the deliverer with the big D. Not just fixing the immediate crisis issues, but Jesus fixes the overarching problem of humanity. That humanity left to its own devices will always live selfishly and in rebellion against God. And in some ways, Haman was the immediate crisis issue but the greater issue is the death of the Jewish people. And isn't death the greatest issue that we all struggle with? Isn't, like, death the ultimate issue? Now, why does death happen? Death happens because of sin. Why does sin happen? Because we inherited a sin nature from the very first people, Adam and Eve. Everybody has it. It looks differently in everyone's life. But left to your own devices, you're going to do selfish things. You're going to think selfish thoughts. You're going to do good things for selfish motives. And if you reflect on your heart, nobody taught you how to do that. You just do that. And we all do it. The, the proof is in your own heart and in my own heart. If you don't believe it, just watch the news, read a newspaper, look at news. On, you, it's everywhere. You see it. All you got to do is look at social media. You could see it all. But Jesus is the great deliverer. And I love that, isn't it? Isn't it a beautiful thing? That Jesus is the great deliverer. See, God has used Mordecai and Esther. But the work isn't done because there's a, a, something greater at stake. Now, if you look through this, you realize that the king gave Esther the house of Haman, Right? And then Esther gives it over to Mordecai. 
And Mordecai finds himself being elevated. He gets the signet ring from Haman. Now, if you're brand new with us, there's a history with the king and, and Mordecai because Mordecai has helped the king in different ways. And so what you find now is you find Mordecai is now ascending to a top advisor for the king because Haman is gone. And right away, Esther comes and she falls down again and she says, in effect, king, listen, we need a new decree because my people are still going to die, right? And the king says, look, I want you to write one that seems right to you. Write what needs to be written and use the signet ring that I gave to Mordecai. So the king realizes that something needs to change or else the Jewish people are still going to die. So the king assents to this. He's like, okay, let's do it. Now look at what happens in verse 9. It says, so the king's scribes were called at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day, it was written down according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, and the princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces in all, to every province in its own script, to every people in their own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed it with the king's signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horses, bred from swift steeds. By these letters, the king permitted the Jews who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives, to destroy, to kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people of the province that would assault them, both little children and women, and to plunder their possessions." So what we find is that a second decree is made. And this mirrors Esther chapter 3 when the first decree was made. Now we have a new decree. And the decree in effect says this. All the Jewish people are allowed to protect themselves. Anybody who wants to come and rise up against the Jewish people, they have the ability to protect themselves. That's what it says. Now, how do I apply this for us? This is simple. Write it down. Write it down. Something powerful happens when we take the things that God is revealing to us and we actually put pen to paper or fingers to keys and actually write it down. Because how often do you have something that you sense God wants you to do and you don't write it down and you never go back to it? It's, it's the act of writing something down almost puts it in concrete. It's like you have to deal with it then. It's there. It's on paper. And I think for many of us, we need to start journaling or writing. You need to, when God lays something on your heart, you need to write it down and share it with yourself or with your loved ones, your spouse. Because something, I, I encourage you when, you, when you come to church, take some notes. I mean, I go back to my first Four years as a Christian, I read the notes. It's amazing the things that God was showing me. It's amazing. You know, like where, where, where the pastor would be preaching and all of a sudden something would be applied personally to me. And I, I have these things where they'd be in boxes with stars. Daniel, God wants you to stop doing this. God wants you to take that step of faith. God wants you to do that thing. And I really encourage all of us to do that. Why? Because God wrote it down for us. It's called the Bible, my friends. See, God gave us his specific revelation in a book so that you and I can open this thing up and say, this is the heart of God. And if God wants us to understand who he is, and he would write it down for us through the hands of men over time, over many generations, we should do the same thing. And don't neglect, because God has written his word down for us, are you a person of the word? Are you somebody who studies and learns God's word? It's great. I've been, I got to spend time this week with uh, Steve and Karen Daly, who have, you know, uh, have been at Crossroads. Now they're out with Wycliffe Bible Translators working on uh, story projects and translations projects for, for people who speak Arabic. And I, it gets me so excited 
Because you and I, we have the Bible in English. We have amplified Bibles. We have this translation and that translation. We have paraphrases. We have all this stuff. You can get it on MP3. Whatever your thing is, you have access to it. But there are people in the world who don't even have access to the Gospel of John in their own language. This is just the story of Jesus. And I love the fact that as a church, we're involved in that. And we all need to be people of the book. We don't want to take it for granted. We should read God's word more than we read anything else that we read. How much time do you spend reading books on how to do Minecraft well or your favorite sports thing or, 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 or your favorite fashion magazine? How much time do you spend flipping through the, the social magazines about whatever your thing is, good, house, or good housekeeping or, or the man's guide to life in the wilderness or whatever your thing is? God has given us his heart in his word, we need to be people of the word. And not just people who read the word, but people who actually think about it and meditate on it and say, God, what does this mean for me and my life? Who am I because of who God is? When was the last time you wrote it down? When was the last time you wrote a, a note of appreciation to somebody who always helps or helps from time to time? We need to be people who write it down. See, in order for this decree that's going to save the Jewish people, it needs to be written down. And not only is it written down, it's written in every language, and it's sent out to the entire empire. It's literally sent out to the entire empire. It says from Ethiopia to India. It gives you a sense of the scope of that empire. All the way from Africa, clear all the way across to India, in, through Southeast Asia. It's an amazing size that we find out that it gets handed to couriers who get on horseback. They're on horseback and they were bred from swift steeds. So you realize that time is of the essence. It's in the third month now. So there's eight, nine months until this day was set to kill the Jewish people. So this thing needs to get through the entire empire in a little more than a half a year so that the Jewish people realize that it is legal for them to protect themselves. I think it's important to note at this point that our Bible tells us that we should be peacemakers, that we should live peaceably with all people when it's within our power. And I, I think we have to remember that in the world that we live in because God wants us to make peace in every way possible. But when we can't, then God wants us to protect ourselves. Protecting ourselves and exacting vengeance are two different things, though, brothers and sisters. They're two different things. God's desire for us is that at all costs, we try and make peace. But when we can't make peace, God wants us to protect ourselves but not exact vengeance. Why? Because the Bible says, vengeance is whose? The Lord's. And you and I can live differently than other people by knowing the line to protect ourselves and not be vengeful because we trust in a God who ultimately will repay. We don't have to exact vengeance because we trust that God will. And so... It doesn't say they're allowed to go out and just kill whoever they want to because they almost got killed and so now they're allowed to do whatever they want because they're just thinking hot mad. It's not that. They're allowed to protect themselves. And brothers and sisters, you're allowed to protect yourself. But you got to ask yourself, are you trying to exact vengeance from somebody? Did somebody hurt you and now you're bent on showing them how hurt you are? No matter what they did, their sin is theirs. Our sin is ours. Brothers, sisters, listen. If you're bent on vengeance right now, you need to commit that to Jesus. And you need to trust that the God who does all things well will be able to exact the vengeance necessary. But that's also why Jesus said we should pray for our enemies. Because how much better... Is it for God to save an enemy than it is for God to destroy an enemy? When God saves somebody who has wronged you, 
by God's grace, they become a family member. That's so much better than just destroying somebody who's hurt us. So much better. Why? Because God didn't destroy us when we were enemies of him. He hasn't done that. He has gone to extraordinary lengths to save us. The beauty of this is with this decree, if nobody lifts a hand against the Jewish people, guess what? Nobody gets hurt. Like this literally, this whole crisis could be averted with absolutely nobody getting hurt at all. It's not going to happen that way, but nobody gets hurt. We have to make sure, brothers and sisters, that we are not men and women seeking to exact vengeance. And you have to say, Spirit of God, search my heart. Because you know what? It's like our hearts are pretty, pretty wicked, ain't they? Some of the stuff in our hearts is just pretty messed up. And the beauty is, is God knows that our hearts are messed up. And God says, look, your heart is messed up, but I'm, by my Holy Spirit, I'm going to come and I'm going to convict you of it so that you bring it to me so that I can change your heart. See, we need to be aware of what's in there so that we can say, Lord, you see what's in there. Can you do a work here? And the Lord's like, yeah, I've been waiting for this. I, I, I'm a perfect heart surgeon. So if you got wickedness in your heart, and you do, because we all do, I definitely do. You know, we just bring that stuff to the Lord. We say, Lord, I'm sorry. My heart, Lord, do the work you want to do in my heart. And the Lord's like, yes. Because he's the great physician. He's got skilled hands. He knows exactly what he wants to do to make you and me more like Jesus, who we really want to be like. All that vengeance, it's destroy. it's hollowing us out on the inside. Don't. Don't make the mistake of living a life of vengeance. It only leads to more pain. Trust the Lord with it. So in verse 15, look what it says. It says, So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple, and the city of Shushan res- Rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor. And in every promise, province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. So, You notice now the sharp contrast with Mordecai. Remember back in chapter 4, Mordecai, when he found out about the decree, he was in sackcloth and ashes and he was wailing. Now we have Mordecai arrayed in royal apparel, blue and white, all these different things. So we see this huge contrast. Notice we find that the Jews, they have light and gladness, joy and honor. These are the antithesis of the four words that we had in chapter 4, verse 3, mourning, fasting, weeping, and wailing. So we find a complete change, total contrast. What does it teach us? It teaches us that righteousness exalts. That's what it teaches us, that righteousness exalts. Now, Mordecai was a righteous man by all accounts. Everything we have about Mordecai here in the story of Esther is that he was a a good guy. He looked out for the king. He raised Esther as his own daughter. You know, all this different stuff. He was always looking out for other people, right? But for a time in his righteousness, Mordecai and his people were really struggling. They were under death sentence. All this stuff was going on. And you have to remember that ultimately righteousness exalts and sin is a reproach. That's actually Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, right? Righteousness exalts a nation and a sin is a reproach to any people. You and I have to remember that when you follow Jesus, you will act like Jesus. And when you act like Jesus, because Jesus is righteous, we should act in a way that is righteous. But not always when you are living righteously will everything go well for you. Isn't that a challenge when you are doing things the right way, somebody who's doing things in a shady way, 
is getting farther, making more money, going past you, and you start to struggle. But that's why, of course, God in his word gave us Psalm 73. Remember, Asaph saw the prosperity of the wicked. And it says that his foot almost slipped. He almost gave in to the ways of the world. But then it says, then he remembered their latter end when he came into the temple. And he realized that although they seem to be prospering now, ultimately sin will not prosper. And it's an encouragement for you and for me to take the steady and long road of living rightly before the Lord because the Lord ultimately will work everything out. See, Mordecai in his righteousness, he could be like, Lord, I'm taking care of the king and now he signs this, king, this, this decree against me and my people and I'm, I'm trying to do everything right and look at what's happening. And I believe some of you right now feel that way. Like, I'm doing everything as best I understand by the Bible when everything's falling apart. Listen, ultimately, righteousness will exalt. It will. But notice I say ultimately and not seemingly always. And that's where we struggle. Don't stop doing what you know to be right because if you take a shortcut, other people are getting where you want to get to quickly. Don't make that mistake. Eugene Peterson calls discipleship the, the art of learning to follow Jesus, a long obedience in the same direction. I really feel that for some of us right now, you're thinking about taking a quick out. Don't do it. You might get to where you want to get to, but ultimately, God will honor and exalt righteousness. And he will humble those who are wicked. That's what our Bibles teach. And this section here, it really shows the complete role reversal. You get a lot of this in the Gospels, don't you? Like the first will be last and the last will be first. Take the lowest seat and then... You'll get moved up, but if you take the high seat, you will be up. See, it's that upside-down nature of the kingdom of God. God asks us to simply respond to Jesus and follow him, and we tr entrust exaltation and blessing to the Lord, and we receive whatever God gives us from his hands, and we say, thank you. We learn how to endure hardship with perseverance. We learn how to... Steward blessings with grace. That's what God wants to do in our lives. But we need to be steady on. We need to not cut corners. Because ultimately righteousness exalts. And we see that here. And we even see that the witness now of what had gone on with Haman and the decree and now Mordecai's exaltation and rise up into power next to the king, we find that people in the city started to become Jews. They started to convert because God's favor on his people as displayed by this change of actions, now people are like, hey, I want to be in on that. Powerful, isn't it? Now, as we move into chapter 9, we see what's going to happen here. So look at, what, look at what it says. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the 12th month, that is, the month of Adar, on the 13th day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. On the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, the opposite occurred, in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. The Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all their provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm, and no one could withstand them because fear of them fell upon all people. And all the officials of the provinces, the satraps and the governors, and all those doing the king's work helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's palace, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai became increasingly prominent. Thus the Jews defeated all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, with slaughter and destruction, and did what they pleased with those who hated them. And in Shushan, the citadel, the Jews destroyed and killed 500 men. Also, Parshadatha, Dalphon, Ashpatha, Poratha, Adalia, Aridatha, Parmish, Parmishta, I was going to say Parmesan anyway, Arisai, 
Aradai and Vajasatha. I don't know if that's right. I just am rolling with it. I had a lot of these this last week at Crossroads, haven't I? The ten sons of Haman, the sons of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, they killed, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. So we find that on that day, all the Jewish people got together to protect themselves. And we find out that in Shushan, where they were, 500 people were killed, including the 10 sons of Haman. Now, what does this teach us? That no weapon shall prosper. That's what we learn. That no weapon fashioned against us will prosper. So it's the day that the original decree went out. The Jewish people got together. No weapon fashioned against the Jewish people would ultimately prosper. And we find that they got together in Shushan, where, the, where, where they were, 500 people. And of course, that phrase, no weapon shall prosper, that's from Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me says the Lord. No weapon is going to prosper against the people of God. It might seem to, but it won't. Now, what's interesting is 500 people did in Shushan the citadel raise up to try and kill Jewish people and plunder them. And what's fascinating is among them were the 10 sons of Haman. Now, think about that for a second. Haman was hung by the king on his own gallows, right? And you can imagine on that day, his sons were like, we're going to avenge the death of our father. And they go and they die with their father as well. We have to open our eyes. Maybe they should have thought to themselves, you know, my dad, he was my dad and I love him, but what he did was just straight up dumb. And if he wasn't being dumb, he'd be here right now. See, but listen, it talks about the heritage of, the, of, of people, what parents give to kids, what we pass down. And you realize no matter what your heritage is, that in Jesus, Jesus wants to give all of us a brand new heritage. If you have a godly heritage, praise God. But guess what? You still were being raised by dysfunctional parents. And I was like, amen. <laughs> Love you, mom, you know. <laughs> But, you know, it's like no matter how great your parents were, they still had issues because they were in process and God's doing a work in their life. But if you're here today and you didn't have a godly heritage, guess what? You get to build a brand new one. Because Jesus, people talk about, you know, a generational curses. Jesus fixes the generational curse problem. He does. He cuts those things right off. There's a brand new heritage. But Haman's sons were cut out of the cloth of their dad, even though they saw the destruction it caused. And I felt led as I prayed about the message just this morning to say, I think for some of you, you're going to commit the sins of your parents, but God doesn't want you to. Like you're, you're going to head down the road that your parents went down, and God is saying, no, 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 I want to cut that off. I want to give you a brand new heritage if you'll let me. Just because your parents were X, Y, and Z does not mean that you have to be sure. You were raised by them. You're going to have leanings like them. But if they were wrong, Jesus wants to change that in your life. You choose to go down that road. And I believe that for some of you right now, you're standing on the precipice. Or maybe you're all the way into the sins of your parents. And God's saying, no, no, no. I want to cut that off. And I want to leads you in a more excellent way. And you have to come to Jesus and you have to say, Lord, help me. You have to get people around you who will hold you accountable so that you don't have to be like what you didn't like in your parents. You don't have to be that. But the sons of Haman, they just follow their dad. Now what's interesting is, notice what it says, and it's just like the end of verse 10, this little note, it says, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. You notice that? So even though 500 people who tried to go out against them, the Jewish people didn't want the money. Why? Because it wasn't about material gain for them. It wasn't like, man, if I kill these people, I can take their house, and I like their house better. It's got a beautiful green belt behind them, or whatever their thing was. It's like they didn't want any prosperity from the sin of somebody against them. 
It shows a window into the heart of the people. Now, as I close out today's message, I'm going to invite the worship team to come on out. Look at what it says here in verse 11. On that day, the number of those who were killed in Shushan, the citadel, was brought to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the citadel, and the 10 sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you, or what is your further request? It shall be done. Then Esther said, if it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Shushan to do again tomorrow according to today's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done, and the decree was issued in Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. And the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day of the month of Adar and killed 300 men at Shushan, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. And the remainder of the Jews in the king's provinces gathered together and protected their lives and the rest of their enemies and killed 75,000 of their enemies, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. This was the 13th day of the month of Adar and on the 14th of the month they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. So we find out on the 13th day of the month when 500 people were killed in Shushan, the king and Esther get together and the king says, okay, so 500 people, I wonder what happened in the rest of the provinces. What else can I do for you? And she says, can we do this again tomorrow? So she says, she says, can we be vigilant tomorrow? Why? That's my point. You and I need to be vigilant. We need to be vigilant. See, the 13th day was the day when all the bad stuff was going to happen. But Esther realizes that, okay, we did good today. But guess what? Tomorrow may not be any easier. So can we protect ourselves again tomorrow? And we find out that they needed to. And brothers and sisters, I want to close with this. I think this is so important. You and I need to live our lives hypervigilantly. Because sometimes we have a victory, and if we let our guard down, then we have a crushing defeat. I mean, think about the children of Israel when they went to the promised land. Jericho was a great victory, followed right on the hills by the defeat at Ai. You know, oftentimes we have this great moment where we rise on up and we do great, and then we let our guard down, and then we get slapped around the next day. Because we think that yesterday's victory is going to ensure today's victory no matter what we do. And I think for a lot of us, especially as it relates to crisis, we make it through a crisis and then we let our guard down and then we get wiped out by the follow-up. How many of us did battle against a sin in Jesus' name and, and, and didn't end up hitting rock bottom only to let our guard down and slide down to rock bottom slowly anyway. Brothers and sisters, there is a battle for the heart of the people of God. It rages every day. It rages through every situation you find yourself in. Compromise and sin, desire not born out of the heart of God, but the depths of our own depravity. It's there. And you and I, we need to do battle and be vigilant. It's not like all of a sudden one day temptation takes the day off. It doesn't take the day off. It's not like Satan, who's the enemy of the souls of people. He does his most profound work within the hearts of the people of God because those who aren't following Jesus, he's like, great, I got you where I want you. It doesn't matter why, how you're there or why you're there. You're exactly where I want you. I don't want you to worship the Lord. And I don't want you to be changed by Jesus Christ. I want you just the way you are. So know what he does? He goes full court press against the people of God. Temptation. I mean, for some of you, you, you fought for your marriage and there's somebody who you meet at the gym or at the grocery store or a coworker who all of a sudden you got your eye on and you know you're playing with fire, but it's there. Maybe you've worked so hard to take care of your family and there's a financial train wreck that's, that's waiting you because you, you have this thing. And man, if I just make a little bit more money, I do this deal and this deal. And, and it's not the Lord, but it's, it gives in to our wants for security and affection and intimacy and all these things. 
I'm not big on looking for Satan around every corner. But I need to be aware that at any moment, all of us can fail miserably. Like we can't be naive. And the key to not being naive is being vigilant. Yesterday's victory will not ensure today's victory. Yesterday's day of sobriety will not ensure today's day of sobriety. Yesterday that wasn't full of you being judgmental will not ensure that you won't be judgmental today. Unfortunately, my friends, that is the battle of the people of God. And I'm here to tell you God's kids fight that battle. God's kids, we have signed up for that to say, I'm not going to let the slide of my own uh, iniquity and depravity, I'm not going to let that stuff be my life. But I'm going to, every single day, I'm going to show up and say, Lord, you are real. I have believed in you. Your blood has cleansed me of my mistakes, Lord. You stood in my place. And God, I am not going to take that for granted today. Amen. I believe for some of us, we've let our guards down. And if you're not getting slapped around, you will. You got to say, Lord, I, Lord, in your name, by the power of the Spirit, will you pick my arms up so that I, I got, I'm vigilant, I'm ready. I think for some of you, today's the day that you're going to start following Jesus for the very first time. Because I'm here to tell you, being a deliverer, that God uses people, knowing that no weapon fashioned against you will prosper, being vigilant, all of these things, it's all about the finished work of Jesus for us and the empowerment that comes from the Holy Spirit because Jesus died and rose again. And if that's you, I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a moment to say yes to Jesus. And I'm here to tell you, it is hands down the most important decision you'll ever make it is the best decision you could ever make. And I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you this. If you follow Jesus, it's not going to make your life super easy. It's not. But what you will know is that nothing will ever pull you out of his hand if you're following him. Nothing will. Your life is hard now anyway. It's just a matter, is my hard life lived under the umbrella of the grace of God, in the family of God, with a seat at the table that at any time I can show up and say, Lord, I need your help. Make that decision today. Don't wait another minute to say yes to Jesus and start that journey. Everything depends on it, and you know it. Let's bow our heads and our hearts and pray. Father, thank you for your word.